sponsors of this event for their support. Um, thank you to the Lawfare Project, the New York County Lawyers Association Committee on Foreign and International Law, and the European Center for Law and Justice. I'd especially like to thank my colleague Richard Stone uh, for encouraging me to become involved. I'd like to thank Jill Strausser and Chris Brooke for their important work in organizing the event, and also my fellow chairs, Robert Wirthbell and Erwin Kotler. We live in a very complicated world, and I want you all to know that I sleep like a baby which means that I wake up every two hours and cry. <laughs> but it really is hard to think of a more important topic than the role of law in combating terrorism and in regulating the conduct of nations. Unfortunately, international terrorism is going to be with us for some time. As we all know, modern technology has made terrorism easier to organize. Terrorist organizations can use the internet to recruit and raise money, put their murderous plans into motion. Proliferation of weapons of mass destruction obviously makes this prospect even more ominous, as does the growing influence of ideologies that promote suicide bombing, the role of state sponsors as sources of funding and terrorist infrastructure. So how should the democracies of the world counter this threat? An essential responsibility of government is to safeguard the security of the people. We want to do this in a way that's true to our values. So as a result, we're challenged to think much harder about the role of law in this sort of conflict. And our conversations today reveal how important and how complicated that subject is. As a lawyer and a law school dean, I'm deeply committed to the rule of law. I'm proud of the contributions my colleagues at Columbia Law School have made over the past five decades in pioneering human rights law and in helping to develop thinking about public international law. Lincoln, Oscar Schachter, Roy Damrosch, Michael Doyle, Sarah Cleveland, and Trevor Morrison have all made significant contributions to this field. I'm also mindful that there is strategic value to the United States and its allies in honoring the rule of law. For example, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, the Kennedy administration understandably did not want to allow the Russians to send supplies, including more missiles, to Cuba. But a blockade would have constituted an act of war under international law. So instead, my colleague, Dick Gardner, who was then a lawyer for the State Department, helped to develop an argument that we were imposing a quarantine in Cuba, not a blockade, and that our actions had the support of the Organization of American States. These arguments are subtle ones, I recognize, especially in light of the colossal stakes, but in legal circles, they did matter. Legal characterizations obviously matter today as well. The point is emphasized by my colleague Matt Waxman, who served in senior roles in the Bush administration, the National Security Council, State, and the Defense Department. The legitimacy of our actions is enhanced when the world regards us as standing for the rule of law, both at home and in the international arena. <coughs> this legitimacy translates into political support at home and abroad, which makes our policies more effective. But of course, to say that we believe in law is not to say that we endorse all the ways that law is used in the public discourse about terrorism and war. We know that law can be misused, even manipulated. For example, sometimes laws are written broadly in order to be sure to capture wrongdoing in its various facets. We then depend on prosecutors to exercise discretion wisely and free of the corroding influence of politics. Unfortunately, in the inter international arena, politics can be all too evident. According to the website of the organization, UN Watch, an alien observing the United Nations debates, reading its resolutions, walking its halls, could well conclude that a principal purpose of the world body is to censor a tiny country called Israel. For example, 2006-2007, the UN General Assembly enacted 22 resolutions condemning Israel, but failed to pass even a single resolution on Sudan's genocide in Darfur. Just as we want international law norms and organizations to target the right problems, we also want them to create the right incentives. For example, combatants should be encouraged to keep civilian populations safe, not to use civilians as human shields. One of the most tragic developments in warfare in recent years is that terrorists have increasingly sought to hide their weapons and their fighters in densely populated civilian areas, and even to fire rockets from these areas. Hamas uses this strategy in Gaza, hoping either to kill Israeli civilians with impunity or to trigger an Israeli reaction that would cause collateral damage in those straw condemnations of the international.
international community. The Goldstone Report shows that this strategy can be all too effective. As Michelle Albertal, Albertal has written, to create standards of morality in war that leave a state without the means of legitimate self-protection is politically foolish and morally problematic. So what is the answer here? What do we do when the rules are being manipulated and misinterpreted so that they don't serve the purposes for which they were created? Part of the answer is that we need to offer wiser and more persuasive legal arguments so that we still stand for the rule of law, but the law produces wise and just outcomes that take both our values and our security seriously. As my colleague Philip Abbott has written, if the laws are inadequate, then they must be reformed to take account of the new strategic context. Failing to do this traps us in the world in which we either act lawlessly to protect our people and thus turn any success into failure, or we await the next attack with the very practices and rules that invited the last one. Another part of the answer is that we need to keep debating these issues, as we've done today, because thoughtful discussion and analysis will bring us closer to the best answers. These issues are difficult, and reasonable people will sometimes disagree. I think it's unfortunate that the public conversation about these issues has not always been civil. Instead of personal attacks, which I'm sorry to say we've seen on both sides of the political aisle, we need rigorous and thoughtful conversation. This is our best hope of getting to the truth. So we have important work to do, and I thank you all for coming. Our legal system can and must, and it will bring us a world that is more secure, just, and